Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the last session that we have today in the SN conference. Uh, we have the session on architecture, frameworks and DevOps. In this session, uh, we will have three technical papers, the presentation of three technical papers. And at the end of the session, we have one presentation of one emerging results and vision papers. So let's start with the first paper that we have today in this session. The title of the paper is A Survey on the Interplay between software engineering and system engineering during systems of system architecting. And Hector Cadavid uh, will present the, the paper today. Uh, hello, Hector, and please, uh, the word Hello. Is yeah. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session. And in this presentation, I'm going to describe the key findings of our survey study on the interplay between software engineering and systems engineering during system system architecting. Uh, so I would like to begin explaining why are we exploring the architecting process of system of systems, considering the interplay between these two disciplines, systems engineering and software engineering. So first of all, this is worth noting that the industries that nowadays are building actual system of systems, like industries in defense, energy, aeronautics, and so on, uh, due to the number of disciplines that they have to deal with in order to build their systems, they are in general governed by a systems engineering process. On the other hand, uh, nowadays it is well known that software is not only a pervasive, but a critical element for the implementation of these kind of systems. And on top of that, it is well known that the interplay between these two disciplines is still not well understood, and it's known that it sometimes is even problematic. So that's why in this study, we are exploring the challenge perceived by practitioners and researchers working in, in, in these application domains when working in the architecting process or architecting phases of analysis, synthesis, and evaluation of system of systems, but considering both levels of architecture at system level and at software level. That to say, considering how both disciplines interact on, on, those, in, on these steps. Furthermore, we are exploring these challenges when dealing with the characteristics of emergent behavior, desired or undesired emergent behavior, and the characteristic of autonomy of, uh, of the constituents of a system of systems. So to do so, we conducted an online survey between December of 2019 and February of 2020. And out of the approximately 335 invitations, we collect 76 responses from people uh, from the domains here mentioned that are the ones I just mentioned. And as you can see here, we have uh, our sample includes people with profile of software engineer, system engineer, or a combination of both backgrounds. And as you can see in this chart, most of the respondents are people from uh, we can consider as practitioners. Now, moving to the findings and regarding analysis related to the, to the requirements, we found that a series of issues related to the way system-related requirements are translated into software level requirements. Particularly, we found that systems engineers mentioned that the lack of domain knowledge of the software engineers often led to the misinterpretation of the system requirements. On the other hand, we also found that software engineers often complained about the system level requirements are often not clear or not complete enough to be translated as software requirements. Besides that, we also found that in some cases, uh, the requirements at both levels include assumptions about the other di discipline. Like for instance, system level requirements often include or made assumptions about uh, where a certain software element would be allocated into the system architecture. Regarding synthesis on how the architectural decisions are made, we found that in many cases, the architectural decisions at system level and at software level were made separately by independent teams. Now, considering problems like the ones mentioned in the, in the previous finding, 
this intuitively doesn't seem to be uh, a good thing. This also means that in most cases, the practice of co-architecting seems to be not being adopted by, by practitioners. Regarding the evaluation, we also found that in many cases, the requirements, the architectural decisions at software level are not evaluated against software requirements. Instead, software level requirements are considered, are considered as implicitly validated if the system architecture was already validated. That's to say, if the system architecture is considered correct, then uh, the software architecture is considered uh, inherently uh, correct as well. In other cases, software level requirements are validated, but only against a higher level system requirements, not software requirements. Now, mo now moving to the characteristics of emergent behavior, uh, we have an interesting finding. Uh, and uh, many practitioners mentioned that some of the actual causes of undesired emergent behavior, which is a big deal for people working on system of systems, are the ones that are often not considered in the architecting process or in the modeling assimilation process of the system of systems. And here we're talking particularly of the lower level elements of the architecture, that's to say the lower level hardware components, like uh, small pieces of, soft, of hardware that could be faulty at some moment or could have some kind of communication problems that due to the granularity of the current modeling and simulation approaches are often not considered. And now regarding the characteristics of independent, uh, independence of the constituents of the system of systems, we found that unclear and incomplete specifications was a common uh, theme in both phases of integration and evolution. That means that these particular problems is carried through the whole cycle of the, uh, the life cycle of the system system, starting from integration and evolution. And we interpret that as this particular problem of incomplete interspace specification can be seen as a cause of technical depth in system of systems. This is interesting though that uh, there is another common uh, theme in this particular topic that is insufficient interface specifications management. This is a common problem also mentioned by, by the practitioners. What is interesting here is this particular issue is seemingly related to the, to, to the one I just mentioned in the sense that if we address the problem of insufficient interface specifications management, it is likely that it will be useful to address the problem of incomplete interspace specifications. Now, I'd like to wrap up this short presentation with the what we consider the main, the key takeaways for, for this topic. First and, and foremost, uh, we have to consider that some of the issues we have mentioned here, particularly the ones related to the, um, for instance, the lack of domain knowledge of software engineers when they are involved in system engineering projects has been already discussed in literature for years. However, we think that uh, given that these uh, issues have been previously reported, but are pers persistent, is something important to be considered as this means that there is, could be a gap between research and practice that is worth to be explored. Another key takeaway um, for this study is something we consider important for people working in modeling and simulation research in system of systems, particularly because in this kind of research, people is trying to identify or to anticipate the causes of emergent behavior. Now, considering that practitioners and mentioned that these are small elements are the ones that are actually creating the emergent behavior, this is something worth to be considered by, uh, by people working in, in, this, in this particular line of research. Uh, furthermore, we think that an important uh, takeaway of this presentation is the importance of um, interface specifications management 
or the importance of research or further research on interface specifications managing, management as a way to deal to both with the, the problems of the system of system architecture in general, but also to the problem of the interdisciplinary interplay between system engineers and software engineers working in this topic. We think that uh, this is the, a key element that could, uh, by further research, could significantly improve the, the problem that we have just identified here. Uh, now, in this sense, as a future work, we are actually exploring system engineering and software engineering harmonization practices. We are conducting empirical research in order to identify actual practices that some of the practitioners have come up with through the practice uh, when uh, dealing with all these challenges uh, in the implementation of system of systems. So this is basically about it. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hector, for the nice presentation. We have uh, some questions from the audience. For example, Maya Daneva from the University of Twente is asking, with regards to the validation of software architecture against system level requirements, what is your interpretation of this? It is expected or surprising, good or bad? Uh, validation of against... OK, well, this is a good question because uh, for some people, this is normal. For me, as a software engineer, it's not normal because, uh, we, I mean, we know there are two levels of requirements. There are higher level requirements, but there are also software level requirements. Uh, now, for some people in the software engineering domain, this is normal because the key, I mean, the most important thing are the system level requirements. However, we can see that here we are not applying the, all, the, all the years of extra expertise and all the techniques to validate architect software architectural decisions using software-related approaches. So I think this is not surprising for, for most people, but I think this is something worth to be further explored by the software engineering community in order to, in, to include these software practices into the system engineering domain. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Or... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eto. There is also another discussion here. Let me read it because it's a little bit uh, long by Stats uh, Ward. As I remember, you referred to uh, system of systems in accordance to Meyer's definition. In this case, the individual system should be deco decoupled yeah. from the system of systems due to clear interface interfaces yeah. of the system, as you said. Yeah. And we saw the next one. But shouldn't the system of systems requirements be fully decoupled of the software requirements of a single system? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a, there is I one mean, more comment. Let me yeah. see. Let me show this. Wait a moment. The system of system has its own requirements, and if a system of system, as defined by Meyer, don't meet the requirements, it usually will will be excluded from the system of systems. The system, uh, let me check the question again. Uh, by let me the requirements. And if the sorry, I I'm trying the to question, the question. The question was this one: Shouldn't the system of system requirements be fully decoupled, decoupled of the software requirements of a single system? Uh, well, I, what I don't get is the the decoupled. Um, I mean the. What I mean, what matters here is software requirements uh, at the end serve the purpose of fulfilling or to contribute to the system level uh, requirements. Uh, now, yes, th there is, I mean, in, when we talk about system of system, we are talking about higher levels of abstraction. Uh, but our point here is in the process, we are actually, I mean, in the practice, people is translating system level requirements into software level requirements. This, this is how things are being done. And we found that there are issues in, the, in this translation from, from what, what is designed at system level and what is actually implemented at software level. And sometimes this is not well translated. Uh, so yes, we believe that this is something that is worth to be explored. And of course, this is something that requires uh, a cooperation between both disciplines in order to be approached in, in the right way. 
Okay, thank you, Hector. I think that uh, you answer uh, the question, and I think that actually is an interesting topic that perhaps you can continue the discussion offline. I think that you can yeah, reach sure. uh, Hector. I'll be able to. Uh, you can find his email, his email address in the in the paper. So to continue the, the discussion, yeah, sure. we need to move to the next uh, paper. Okay, I'll happy to. Thank you very much, Hector. Now okay, we thank move you. to the second one. So uh, let me show here the title of the next paper is DevOps and uh, in in an ISO 13485 uh, regulated environment a multivocal literature review. Uh, the paper will be presented by uh, Martin Lee. Uh, thank you, Martin. So now the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Lee, and I would like to present you the results of a multivocal literature review uh, of the use of DevOps in a regulated software development environment. Uh, we have focused uh, on the EU Medical Device Directive through the implementation of the quality standard ISO 13485. This work is done together with uh, Mary Sanchez Gordon and Ricardo Colombo Palacios. Uh, at the Univers uh, Østfold University College. Uh, we can say that companies in regulated areas have two customers, the buying and the permitting. Being able to develop, market, sell, ship and support a medical device product in the EU is regulated business. Compliance is a continuous process that must be approved by an external partner at certain time intervals. We observe a growing difference between agile approaches and traditional regulated development. Although some examples of successful DevOps in regulated domains exist, the research is scarce. The objective of this study is to review the current state of DevOps uh, in the medical domain. Before DevOps can be introduced as a development approach, uh, we need to assess the fundamental challenges and benefits. An initial search for secondary studies yielded few results, uh, but a recent literature survey was presented by Laukarainen and others. They discuss DevOps practices and tools in regulated software development and describe that some improvements in tooling, documentation, and regulatory requirements are necessary. Our paper investigates and identifies DevOps implementation challenges, benefits, and strategies in the regulated domain uh, industries. We do this by doing a multivocal literature review, uh, where we study uh, gray literature, including primary studies. Our research questions was formulated to capture the state of DevOps in regulated development, especially focusing on medical device development by ISO 13485. What evidence is there of such use? What are the challenges and benefits? Could DevOps result in shorter development cycles? And what is done to ensure a regulatory compliance? We found few studies of DevOps in a ISO 13485 context, so a multivocal literature review of scholarly and gray literature was decided to perform. And NVLR has a broader scope of sources than other studies and captures up-to-the-date opinions of experts and community by including material such as news articles, blog posts, videos, etc. From the index sources, 1120 sources was extracted based on a rule of theoretical saturation limitation and effort bounded. 566 sources remained after duplicate merging and after three steps of inclusion, exclusion and quality assessment steps, our candidate list had 30, 23 sources. The references contained herein was followed and the same inclusion, exclusion and quality criterion was applied, adding four new sources. So 27 sources remain for our analysis. 
Our research showed that DevOps has its uh, challenges, but with potential benefits. Reduction of cost, time, and resources are observed, as well as reduction in defects, increased product quality, and fulfillment of user needs. A transition to DevOps must be anchored in top-level management. Our research found that the DevOps process itself may not be subjected to regulatory approval. The process must fulfill requirements in an approved QMS. An interesting finding is the Q interface, which maps QMS processes to DevOps processes. Uh, healthcare is a slow mover, but is undergoing a silent move towards DevOps. Changing a culture from traditional development to DevOps is considered a great obstacles, obstacle. Silos of processes make collaboration harder. Security restrictions and external partner integration also complicates this. Uh, DevOps is found to be vital for adopting to new regulations. DevOps bring continuous focus on areas of risk management and safety, leading to better quality and compliance. DevOps is seen as a prerequisite for microservices, containerization, and cloud services. Going cloud native means that verification tasks could be moved to parallel environments. So can verification and validation be shortened? Yes, several improvements were found. Feedback loops are accelerated, reduction of cost in time and resources, and a reduction in defects, which could reveal both better quality and better fulfillment of user needs was found. Shortening the release cycle is enabled by automated infrastructure management, where configuration changes can be made repeatable and standardized. Defects and updates are addressed through tight collaboration and frequent deployments. Blockchain-based enterprise solutions can both accelerate application delivery and comply with regulatory requirements. Introducing the concept of defining compliance as code Compliance as code is expected to have a huge impact. So what are the extensions for compliance? Unit testing must be completed and approved before integration takes place. All tasks and activities must be completed before the software is released. Tools must be validated and releases must be repeatable. Configuration items must be controlled. Other points for extending, extending traditional DevOps. Uh, implement solid automated delivery pipelines. View auditors as stakeholders and handle risk as configuration items. Use a common ticketing system and have tight tool integration between your systems. So what are the limitations to our research? The selected sources could be biased toward popular trends and products. Our pre-assumptions, background, and knowledge could further emphasize this. The data extraction procedures could be too narrow in terms of extracting conflicting views that are not captured by search strings and inclusion criteria. The low amount of sources also reveals that more research is needed in this field. As the field is rapidly moving forward, it is assumed that non-written knowledge could be substantial and should be captured by other methods. So the conclusion, DevOps is a good fit for regulated domains and potentially more suited than other process frameworks. DevOps is to transition from feature boxed to time boxed release strategies and understanding that software cannot be completely 
defined in advance. Uh, observe that there might be areas where DevOps is not a good fit. To introduce DevOps, top-level management anchoring is very important and necessary resources must be available for DevOps. So this concludes my presentation and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Thank you, Martin, for the nice presentation and the clear presentation. There are some questions from the audience. So the first question is now that um, how DevOps is different from Agile in your work? In fact, there are some uh, publications on how Agile uh, can be used in regulated environments, not uh, specifically perhaps DevOps, but uh, how Agile can be used in these kind of environments. So how is DevOps different from Agile in your work? Or what could be specific for, for DevOps according to your study? Um, well, I, I think that uh, Agile in this, um, is uh, defining some processes while DevOps defines some other processes. DevOps is uh, more like uh, development and operation uh, as a whole. So you include operation of some software component or some software system, while Agile uh, might uh, focus more on the development part of, of, uh, uh, of this. And this makes uh, uh, DevOps particularly suited for me the medical domain, where you have um, requirements for operational measures as well. OK. And do you think that? Uh... The same, for example, if I understood well, one of your findings is that the support of the top management is important. Uh, yep. It's the same than in Agile. Do you think that there are things that might be more specific because of DevOps? For example, the, the importance of tools, for example? Uh, I think it's uh, um, very important uh, to, um, to have top level management support just because that you're working in a regulated area. Uh, in the ISO 13485 paradigm, you have to uh, anchor all processes that affect product quality in top-level management. So that's the direct connection to, to, uh, to the finding of um, or, um, having top-level management in the process. So uh, I think that uh, whether you're using DevOps or some other kinds of agile technique, um, top level anchoring is very important for you uh, if you work in a, in a medical regulated area. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, I was just wondering whether tools are particularly important in the DevOps, uh, DevOps uh, area. Anyway, I have another question as well for you. I'm curious to know what is your experience in using the gray literature? for studying a software engineering topic. I mean, uh, the, in the community, the researchers are starting to use more and more the gray literature. So what has been your experiences in using this kind of literature? Do you think that this literature is real, reliable? If I remember well, one of the steps in your research process was to assess the quality of the um, primary studies or your sources in this case. So what, what has been your experiences in using this kind of literature for your study? Uh, I, can, we, can we state the first uh, question again? Because the connection was a bit bad. I didn't understand. I was asking about the, you were using, I mean, you did a multivocal literature review. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And you use gray literature. Yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to know your experiences in using yeah. gray literature in your study. I think that the number of search hits was tremendous. Uh, there was a lot of information that uh, we needed to classify because uh, there was a lot of duplicates. Uh, there was a lot of blog posts that were uh, supporting sales processes that actually didn't have any information that was uh, valuable. So um, the problem was that the primary studies was rather scarce. Uh, there was uh, rather little information in this field. So by doing a multivocal literature review, we could try to find uh, if there are any domain experts or opinions that could influence on the research questions. Um, I, I think that uh, you have to use multivocal literature reviews. Um, uh, you have to be very very focused when using that and, and criticize all your findings because there are a lot of information that 
uh, not necessarily is supportive of you supportive uh, of your, your hypothesis um, and the reason for those might not be because the source have knowledge in that but because they have opi opinions that that uh, it's not necessarily correct so yeah basically Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Let's have uh, time. We have time for one more last question. So, one question for um, the audience. Have you identified any security concerns for microservices in DevOps? Yeah, uh, that is one of our findings. Um, if, you, if you are planning to use microservices in, 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 this, uh, in regulated areas, it's very important that your operational platform, uh, like Kubernetes, uh, Dockerization by by uh, or co containerization by Docker, etc., that your uh, service provider is um, uh, providing enough security and enough validation uh, management, for ex for example, to adhere to the requirements in ISO 13485. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, there are more questions from the audience, but uh, unfortunately, we need to move on so because we need to go to the next paper. So please feel free to send an email to Martin. I think that you can find the email address in the in the proceedings. And uh, it's, uh, I'm happy to see that the, our audience is uh, really good and is uh, asking a lot of questions. But we need to move on. So thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Okay. Let's move then to the next paper. The title of the next paper is Challenges in Docker Development, a large, case, a large scale study using Stack Overflow. And Mavin uh, will uh, present the paper for us. Now I'm going to present the paper Challenges in Docker Development, a large scale study using Stack Overflow. Authors are myself, Mubi Nulhok. Leonardo Horn, Iowa, and M. Ali Barber. We are from the University of Adelaide, Australia, and this research is partially funded by Cyber Security Cooperative Research Center, Australia. First of all, I am going to briefly describe about our work. Software developers are showing a greater interest in adopting Docker technologies in their development and operational activities. This growing interest is due to the fact that Docker technology supports a convenient process for creating and building containers, promoting close cooperation between developer and operations teams, and enabling continuous software delivery. As a fast growing technology, it is important to identify their challenges. Our paper tries to answer this question. Here, I am going to talk about the motivation of our paper. Each year, Stack Overflow conducts a survey covering everything from the developer's favorite technologies to their job preferences. Docker has been ranked first in most wanted platform, second in most loved platform, and third in platform in use in the annual survey with the participation of almost 90,000 developers around the world in 2019. In fact, Docker was added for the first time in the survey of 2019, looking for developers' preference in different technologies. This survey result is a clear indication of developers' massive interest in Docker technology. In addition, Docker is one of the fastest increasing tech in Stack Overflow in recent years. Therefore, in this paper, we present an empirical study by mining posts from Stack Overflow to explore developers' perspective on Docker technology. Our methodology consists of mainly two steps. Number one, creation of Docker-related dataset, and number two, preparation of data. To collect and analyze data, we have used ESO Torrent and Google BigQuery. The first step is tag-based filtering. In this step, a set of tags have been developed to extract Docker questions. We calculate the significance and relevance of each tag to filter out necessary tags. Then we used content-based filtering as there might be cases in which a Docker post doesn't have any of these appropriate tags. One such example is shown here, discussing Docker container linking issues which doesn't have any tags related to Docker. 
since there is a lack of a standard process to assign tags to a stack forward post and there are still many docker posts with no docker tags we motivated to examine the content of posts besides tag as well we combine questions from these two filtering and obtain the docker related data set our data set contains questions and accepted answer of docker technology then we apply preprocessing techniques this involves noise removal and stemming after preprocessing we apply topic modeling in clean corpus specifically we used latent related allocation or lda from lda we gathered 30 topics and each topic with a list of 10 words we investigate the topic words and, and assign a topic name afterwards by using open cut sort method we categorize each topics our categorization provides 13 categories overall this is all about the identification of docker topics and categories here we are presenting our results for our first research question docker topics asked by developers are determined using lda topic inference and labeling as mentioned in previous slide this figure shows the percentage of number of topics and categorization of topics from this figure it is clear that developers ask more questions on basic concepts this is in line with general understanding that developers are looking for primary knowledge relating to docker and a list about networking error topics in terms of categories developers ask most questions on application development reflecting their keen interest to build applications using docker platform user authentication receives less questions than other categories this research question focuses on the popularity and difficulty of question for each topic in a more fine-grained manner identifying popular and difficult topics allows us to organize the existing knowledge base and draw concrete insights that is we are able to identify topics that are trending in docker community as well as the adoption of specific technologies also difficult topics such as that more attention might be needed to improve frameworks and tools of which developers are facing most challenges during their use or configuration we also examine if there is any statistical correlation between popular and difficult topics in order to characterize docker related posts we calculated this matrix for all 30 topics here we are presenting top three popular and difficult topics and our experiment suggests that negative correlation among popular and difficult topics in other words difficult topics are less popular and vice versa in this research question we investigate whether the lack of experts is one of the factors behind the difficulty in getting answers to docker questions by experts we mean the users who provide significant contribution effective and helpful answers to the stack overflow community from this figure we can observe that docker experts are represented mostly at the left side of the graph which represents the presence of novice users with a lower expertise value or the users with the less score in the expertise value besides the right side of the graph illustrates the expert users with higher expertise value the users from the baseline sample machine learning and web development are mostly represented here in addition a higher peak is observed for all other domain than docker users the higher peak indicates that the number of docker experts is indeed smaller than the baseline sample therefore it is evident that the docker domain is has a much lower number of experts than the baseline sample here baseline sample refers to the general posts of stack overflow not to any particular technology here we present our takeaways kubernetes is used extensively among the developers thus it is a clear indication of replacing docker native orchestration tool that is docker swarm secondly networking issues like bridging docker networks and connection management are harder to solve thirdly 
Configuration is playing a crucial part in Docker technology. Developers are constantly looking for Docker container configuration. Among the most trending topics, continuous integration is topmost. It is of no surprise as Docker is in the process of DevOps pipeline. And trends on basic concepts are declining in fast, which is indication of a mature state. Lastly, we need Docker experts. This gap can be also explained by the earlier studies, which states that Docker development requires knowledge of various domains, such as operating system, distributed networking, cloud computing, and software engineering. We acknowledge that this study has limitations. Firstly, identification of Docker-related posts from Stack Overflow. To address this limitation, we used both tag and content-based selection to cover a wide range of Docker posts. Secondly, finding optimal number of topics for the corpus. In this case, we simulated our modeling over 10 to 50 topics with interval of five, and then choose best topic number based on the coherence value. And lastly, providing names to the topics. Generally, topic modeling, in our case LDA, provides a list of words for a particular topic. We performed manual inspection of each topic. We considered top 15 highly rated posts from a topic and then try to name the topic. Again, we consider 15 randomly posts from that topic and identify if the topic name matches with the randomly selected posts. Thus, we try to minimize the effect of this limitation. Several studies are performed to investigate developer's perspective by using Stack Overflow data. Some examples are machine learning, mobile, security, and the list goes on. Besides, the Docker has been explored in terms of DevOps and artifacts like Docker files. However, there is a gap to catch the actual thought of developers. What are they thinking? How the trends are going on? And what we need to do to adopt this technology? Our study fills this gap by performing empirical study on Docker-related posts from Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is the most vibrant community for the developers, and more than 500 questions are asked in every week on Docker technology. We believe our research will be a baseline for several future research works. Our study reveals that almost 6% of Docker questions are unanswered and almost 60% of the questions have no accepted answer, which is pretty high if we consider other technologies. This could motivate to develop an automated question answering for Docker technologies. Secondly, Docker Forum, a dedicated question answering sites for Docker users only can be also explored. It will be interesting to see if the results are in line with our findings. Thirdly, security issues of Docker is a primary concern. Investigating security posts in Docker can be a major contribution. In aforementioned con context, we provide a large scale study over 130, more than 130,000 posts from Stack Overflow community to understand their interests and challenges. We hope that this dataset and our contributions can be a significant foundation for software community. With this, I like to conclude here my presentation. So we also acknowledge Cyber Security Research Center, Australia, and the supercomputing resources at the University of Adelaide. We also like to thank Preet and Roland and Anonymous Rivers for their valuable comments. Here are our reference lists, and I'd be really happy to take any questions and answers, and you can also visit our preprint and reproduction package mentioned in this link. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mugin. Uh, can you hear us? Because I think that we have previously some internet uh, connection problems. Can you hear us well? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, great. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, let's pick this one. Nice presentation, Mugin. How relevant do you consider the results based on the expertise of the Stack Overflow members you sampled? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So we have a sample randomly from a stack overflow and it is not uh, particular to any tag. For example, we didn't consider how, uh, I mean, we have covered a wide range of 
tags like uh, Java, PHP, C Sharp, C++, uh, MySQL, and a lot of tags. I mean, it has been uh, generalized tags on the Stack Overflow. So it is just randomly sampled. And we have considered the users who have asked questions on that topic or that question and try to calculate the value based on the how accurate, uh, how, I mean, what are their, how qualityful is the question and also that how much uh, user reputation and other attributes for the users as well. So we have followed that approach to calculate the expertise values. The next question is, how did you choose the number of topics? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very important question that uh, the, for choosing the number of topics, we have actually relied on the coherence values or the coherence score. Uh, so in that approach, we have uh, utilized almost five to 50 topics at an interval of five. I mean, we have calculated the coherence value for five number of topics, 10 number of topics, 15 number of topics, and this gradually goes to 50 number of topics. And then we have uh, identified that for 30 number of topics, we are getting the most, uh, I mean, the uh, better coherence values. From that angle, we have picked the 30 number of topics. Okay, thank you. Um, let's have la just the last uh, question because we need to move to the next paper. So how do you identify some issues are challenging to address? Okay, so we have used the state of the art approach. That is that how we are actually uh, identifying this difficulty of the topics. Like uh, for example, we have identified, uh, we have uh, utilized two metrics from Stack Overflow. That is that uh, how much percentage of the questions are, uh, are not getting any accepted answers. And number two, that how many time it requires to get an accepted answer. So based on these two matrices, we have actually used that uh, that, for example, that already mentioned that networking issues are mostly getting not accepted answers. That is how we have addressed those challenging issues. Okay, thank you, Moving. There are uh, more questions to you, but I, I ask you to continue the discussion in the YouTube channel or over email uh, because we need to move to the next one. Thank you for your presentation again. And now let's go to the uh, last paper that we have for this session today. It's an emerging result and vision uh, paper. And the title is Web Frameworks for Desktop Apps and Exploratory Study. And Dion Luca Escocia will uh, present the paper. So please, uh, Dion. Hello, everyone. My name is Gianluca Escocia. I am a postdoc researcher at the University of L'Aquila. And I will present our work, Web Frameworks for Desktop Apps and Exploratory Study. So the focus of our work is actually on desktop web app frameworks, which are some novel frameworks that are coming out in the, in the last few years that allow the development of desktop applications employing web technologies. What does this mean is that you can develop a desktop application employing HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So the advantage of using one of these frameworks is that uh, you can actually build a cross-platform application. So you can uh, code it once and then run it on different platforms like on Windows and on Linux. And also you have access to native APIs that generally are not available to standard web applications. And finally, they allow for code and skills reuse. So a web developer can reuse the, the skills he already possesses to develop a desktop application. Currently, there are two main frameworks that uh, uh, offer these functionalities, and their names are uh, Electron and NWJS. And there are actually some quite popular applications that have been developed using uh, these technologies, like WhatsApp, Slack, or Skype. So most likely, if, even if you're not aware about these technologies, you are actually using them in your day-to-day -day life. On the other hand, but we, the research community has not investigated the, these applications. So what we have done was to conduct a, an empirical study on these kinds of applications to understand what are their, their characteristics. But also, we want to understand if the benefits they promise are actually there in practice and also if there are any drawbacks on, uh, related to the usage of these applications, of these, of these frameworks. So we have collected around 450 uh, applications developed with these frameworks that are uh, open source, uh, available on GitHub, 
and uh, again employ one of the two on the two frameworks that we investigated. So we focused our study on a series of different aspects, and uh, the first one that we focused on was uh, actually what kind of applications are developed and employed in these frameworks. And we found, as you can see from the picture, that uh, uh, these frameworks are actually used to develop applications mostly related to the professional sphere. So you can see that the top categories that the developers declared for their apps are productivity, developer tools, and utilities. While instead, these are uh, less common for uh, entertainment applications. And this is uh, actually not surprising if you consider that in the last few years, entertainment applications have moved to other uh, domains like, for instance, mobile devices. So they are less common on the desktop and more common on the mobile. And also we investigated what is the size of the, the development team of a desktop web app. And we found this uh, question interesting because actually most of the benef benefits offered by these applications are um, aimed at the development teams of uh, small dimensions. If you have a, a, a development team of uh, greater in size, you can uh, develop a, a specific application for each of the platforms you want to target. So while if you have limited resources, this, this may be more difficult. And in fact, we found that uh, in, uh, in practice, the, these frameworks are mostly used by teams of limited dimensions. So in our data set, only sporadically, the size of the team exceeds the 10 units. Another aspect we, we investigated was uh, what are the um, was code reuse. So we investigated the, what are the, uh, the libraries, the web libraries that are mostly used inside this kind of desktop applications. And we found that, indeed, uh, web libraries are uh, quite frequently used in the development of this application. So we found that there was a median of seven libraries for each uh, application in our data set. But also, there were some that used more than 100. So in the case of more complex applications, reusing code is quite essential to develop the application. And, and then we also looked, as you can see from the table, at what are actually the most, the most used libraries in, inside this kind of application. And we found that uh, the, the most used libraries are the ones that related to the design and, and, uh, and assist the developer in the design of the user interface, so to realize in, in the user interface of, of the application. But also, there are, there are uh, libraries that also assist in other aspects that are um, uh, more important for desktop applications that, than for the standard web applications. For instance, we found several uh, libraries that are commonly used that uh, are related to uh, file manipulation, which is a task that is uh, maybe not necessary when you are uh, uh, developing a, a traditional web application, but is more important for a desktop application. And finally, another aspect we considered was the, uh, the presence of uh, platform compatibility issues. So we wanted to see if actually uh, developing a, a cross-platform application employing one of these technologies is actually very easy, or the developer encounters uh, some issues or bugs while, uh, while doing so. So what we have done was to collect uh, the, the issues that are reported on the GitHub repository of the applications in your data set, and then we manually analyze the sample of these issues. And we tagged the one that were uh, related to uh, some sort of platform compatibility issue. So by our manual analysis, we found out that actually uh, for the issues that are uh, bug reports, almost one in five issues is actually uh, a platform compatibility issue. So these kind of, uh, of uh, issues are quite frequent and can be uh, uh, a considerable uh, drawback when employing these kind of frameworks. So the, developing an application for more, more than one platform is not as easy as advertised, maybe. And going forward, we want to, uh, uh, these are some points that we want to explore more in the future. So first of all, again, to focus, focusing on uh, platform compatibility issues, we want to see actually how impactful are they. So are these uh, uh, easy to fix or they require quite some time to be fixed? And also, we want to see if they are more common for some platform or actually they appear uh, evenly across all platforms that are supported. Also, we want to focus on other aspects that we have not considered in this first initial study. So we want to uh, investigate other potential criticalities. 
For instance, since these applications are still executed inside the browser, they came with a quite substantial performance uh, overhead and, and also can uh, have quite a substantial energy consumption overhead. So we want to investigate if it is actually issues that developers feel during the de development of these applications or not. And finally, we want also to involve developers directly into our study because we want to, to deepen and confirm the results of our study. So what is actually the experience of developers during the development of this kind of application? And uh, do they uh, feel the issues that we found while analyzing this uh, data? So this, is, this concludes my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, we are available at the following, at the following email addresses. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gianluca, for your presentation. We have time for, for one or two questions. Uh, first, the first comment is that uh, the audience are happy about your research. Great research topic, congratulations. Uh, I have a question for you. So you said that uh, you plan to focus on this um, call it compatibility, uh, well, compatibility issues yes. platform. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because the audience are happy with this research topic. So how do you think that researchers we can help in this uh, topic? Well, yes. So uh, what, I'm up, what can happen is that uh, actually some features offered by these frameworks don't work on some platform while they work perfectly on some other platform. So they can work on Windows, but not on Linux, for instance. So for instance, what we can do as researchers is actually understand what are the root causes behind this uh, malfunctioning. So why are these uh, features not uh, equally supported that are, uh, across all platforms? And also maybe more on a long-term plan, also how we, can we better enable developers to uh, create these kind of frameworks that allow development across multiple uh, platforms? So. Okay, good. Just uh, one the last question. So in your opinion, do you recommend people to use desktop web frameworks? This is a tricky question, actually, because it's what we want to understand with, uh, in our study. So it is actually, there are some drawbacks, so are these substantial or not? So currently, what I can say from our results is that if, you have, if your team is limited in size, yes, for sure, because it probably doesn't have the resources to create multiple apps for each platform. And uh, also, um, uh, depends also on, on the, the amount of uh, uh, code and skills reuse that you can um, uh, take advantage of. If you already have a web application, maybe the porting to a desktop application is easy and uh, or can be more complicated instead if you have to develop everything from the ground up. And finally, we are in contact with uh, some developers and one of them, for instance, uh, said to us that actually they are having troubles with supporting Linux. So. Not all platforms are equal in, uh, in what features are supported right now. So it depends also on the platform you want to support. If you want to support uh, all, every platform uh, in existence, it may be more complicated. But if you are happy with only the major ones, so maybe Mac and Windows, these uh, may be more recommended right now. OK, OK. Thank you for, for, the, for the answer. There are uh, a couple of more questions that I hope that you can then continue the discussion uh, offline. We need to finish uh, the session today because I think that we are running out of time. Just thank you to all the authors. Also, thank you to the audience because I think that uh, you are helping us a lot and you are being a great audience uh, asking questions. Just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow we will come back to, to the next uh, session. I think that we are starting tomorrow. At, uh, let me check the program, but I think that we are starting at uh, uh, 20 past one uh, tomorrow again. So I hope that you enjoy the day. Have a nice uh, rest of the day and good night for all of uh, all of uh, the ones that uh, they go to sleep. And I hope to see you tomorrow. I hope that you enjoy the day. Bye bye.